Welcome to the Mi Camino series, where our alumni share about their pathway into and through UC San Diego and on to their careers. Today, we are joined by Arnulfo Manriquez, CEO of the Metropolitan Area Advisory Council of San Diego, also known as Max San Diego. Welcome, Arnulfo, and thank you for being with us today. Thank you, thank you for having me. Well, I'm super excited that you're here today. What I'd like to do is I'd like to get us started um, learning a little bit more about your childhood. I knew that you grew up in the region here. You were born in Mexicali. And would you mind sharing a bit with our listeners what your childhood was like and if there are any specific experiences that stand out that helped you shape your trajectory into college? Well, yes, I grew up on, on, in this region, and, and I love saying region because it's on both sides of the border. I um, was born in Mexicali, lived in Tijuana until I was 10, and then came to the U.S. Uh, in the fifth grade. Mm -hmm. And I think what helped, um, you know, my growing up, what helped my trajectory to go to college was a couple of things. Uh, resiliency, right? Being able to, um, by the time I was in Tijuana, I went to two different elementary schools came to the U.S. to the fifth grade to a new, a new country, a new language. Um, and then the sixth grade, I got moved to another school. So by the time I was in sixth grade, I was in four different schools and, and, a, and two countries where I had lived in. That helped me adapt, mm. uh, learn how to adapt, how to adapt to new things. But ultimately what helped my trajectory into college was my sisters. Uh, I have four older sisters, I'm the youngest of five. And all of my sisters went to college. Um, by the time I was a freshman in high school, they were all in college. So when I became a senior, they were graduating from college. And I had this um, plan that I just wanted to start working and making money. Okay. Like I was you know, an 18 year old ready to start uh, earning money. And uh, my sister, Gabriela, she asked me like, what colleges did you apply? And I said, I'm not, I'm not going, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to work. Um, and she was a student at UCSD at the moment. And she said, oh no, you gotta, you gotta at least apply to one. And um, brought the application for UCSD and helped me fill it out. I wrote my essay and we turned it in. Um, and that really is how, you know, the big influence that I had to, um, to come to UCSD and go to college and come here. Now, I remember when we chatted a little bit earlier, you mentioned that in high school, your counselor, your high school counselor, had a different understanding of what you were capable of. Can you want to talk a little bit about that? Yes, I went to school at Hilltop High School. And it was at the time, probably about 50% Latino students in the school. And I was, I always did my homework. I always did my class. I did well in my exams, uh, had a very high GPA. And when I was called in, uh, the first time I was called in to the counselor, he gave me an application to apply to the community college and um, asked me a few, few uh, random questions. And he said, so fill out your application. You're about to graduate and I'll see you later. Uh, fast forward a couple months, he, he calls me into his office and asked me if I completed my application to go to the community college. And I said, no, I didn't. And I remember his reaction was like, well, don't you care about your future? Don't you wanna uh, go you know, mm -hmm. study a little bit more? Education's gonna be important. And I told him, well, I got accepted to UCSD, so I'm gonna go there. And he literally almost gasped, right? Uh, stood up and, and opened up my folder, which has all my information. And he says, you have excellent grades. Wow, congratulations. He had no idea. Right. He had no idea of what my grades were. I think he had already pigeonholed me into your, you hang out with the Latinos. Um, uh, m many of them, we were not, had a, we did not have a trajectory to college and he had not even bothered to look at my grades. Um, so yeah, it was a, it was an eye open experience, but it, it didn't hit me until later. Right. And I, I wanted you to share that because I, I want our viewers and listeners to hear that story because I think that if we have young people who are listening and who are contemplating college and they're not getting the guidance that they need or they're perhaps getting a different message, it's important, them, it's important for them to hear that there might not be people at their school who are knowledgeable or who see them as college ready 
even though they might see themselves as college ready. And so it's gonna be important for them to seek out that guidance from other people perhaps. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, well, absolutely. And, and I think that even if you don't think you're college ready, you might say, I don't have my grades, so I don't think I'm gonna be going to college. We are all capable of going to school. Like we are all capable of taking our time and figuring out how we're gonna get our education. And so uh, if you are interested, but you may think my grades are not there, like there's, there are resources, right? You, there's a lot of proactive steps that we have to take. Um, and it's difficult at that age because you don't even think about it, mm -hmm. um, but there's always an opportunity. Great point, thank you for making that point. So what I'd like you to do maybe a little bit more is talk to us a little bit about the organization that you're the chief executive officer for. It's locally known as Max San Diego. Um, tell us a little bit about that. Well, the organization is a 58 year organization. We started out in 1965 during the war on poverty, um, civil rights movement. And the, the focus was really to help Mexican-Americans get into better jobs, uh, better opportunities. So MAC, the original name, is the Mexican-American Advisory Committee back in 1965. And in the 70s, the name changed to Metropolitan Area Advisory Committee to be able to, to be more encompassing of the work that we do. It's primarily work with low-income households, and it's, uh, the pathways are education, health, housing, economic development, with leadership and advocacy embedded in everything that we do. So we, through affordable housing, through early childhood education, through uh, charter schools for students that have dropped out of high school, through drug and alcohol recovery homes and economic development, getting people into better paying jobs, uh, getting people to complete their education, and then ultimately get into a place where families become self-sufficient. Um, they can start buying a house, start building generational wealth. Um, there are a lot of opportunities out there and many times uh, households and families, they don't, they don't know what resources are there that can help them get to, get to those uh, self-sufficiency moments. Yeah, so I know like that I wanna kind of key in about not knowing because sometimes um, access to information, access to resources is something that our community um, has to overcome. And so I was wondering if you could share a little bit about how you got into this particular line of work in working with a community-based organization. Uh, I, you, you nailed it with access to information uh, and opportunities. It was through UCSD and because of UCSD that I'm in the field that I am right now. Uh, my degree was urban studies and planning uh, here at Muir College. I was in my second to last quarter before I was gonna graduate. And uh, the teacher, the professor, Keith Pezzoli, had brought in a, a speaker that was talking about affordable housing and uh, being developed by a nonprofit organization. So as, as weird or naive as it may sound, I had no idea what a nonprofit was. Mm -hmm. I had not been exposed to nonprofit work. And the, uh, the speaker went on to talk about, we build affordable housing for farm workers and, and specifically so that farm workers did not have to move with the crops and therefore having their children move school after school. And so I remember going from so many different schools, I prefer that I would have just stayed at one. But she also went on to talk about, you get an opportunity to help a family have a stable home but you also work with architects and contractors and banks and finance and uh, city planning and you, you basically build something that's gonna be there for long term. You can make a career out of this, you get paid uh, and, um, and it's something that you feel good about doing. Mm -hmm. and, and I sat there thinking that's what I wanna do. Mm -hmm. I, I wanna work with a nonprofit building affordable housing. Uh, and, a few weeks later, I was able to have a meeting with uh, uh, the speaker. Her name was Heather Elting Ballard. And I said, I wanna work here, where you work. Yeah, they, don't, they didn't have any jobs, but they gave me an internship, an unpaid internship. After a couple of weeks of my internship there, learning about it, you know, some administrative work, but also learning about how they work with, uh, with the financing and buying uh, buildings and land, um, they were able to uh, find a job, create a job for me, and I became the third employee of this organization that's now known as Community Housing Works. Oh, okay, wow. 
And um, if you could share a little bit about your transition into UC San Diego, we've heard about you getting ready to graduate and being inspired by this speaker. And I'm wondering what it was like when you first came to UC San Diego. So my first experience on campus was during orientation. And um, I came with my dad. Uh, my dad was, because I still didn't want to go. Even though I got accepted, I still didn't want to go to college. I wanted to work. So my dad came with me, which is something he never did. Like he didn't do it with my sisters, but they, they knew they wanted to go to college. And I remember thinking, wow, like I, I don't see any other Mexicans here. Mm -hmm. um, anybody that, you know, coming from a school that was 50% Latino was a big shock. And, and I was not necessarily feeling like I belonged mm. here. Uh, and so after orientation, I remember talking with my dad and I'm like, I, just, I don't want to go. Like I, I did not want to go to school. But then I received um, an invitation to Summer Bridge mm. through, the, through OASIS, the Office of Academic Support and Instructional Services. Still remember Me all too. the acronym there about the Summer Bridge program where you can come in uh, before school starts, uh, be able to feel a little bit more comfortable understanding that you know other people like me uh, mm -hmm. come into school here. And it's what changed my, I would say it changed my life. It changed my desire to want to come in school. Uh, the friendships that I made there, I, I still have them to this day. Of, um, uh, so they're lifelong friends that I made through Summer Bridge, but it's what kept me in college. It's what made me want to come and stay here. That's great to hear. Oasis is still here with us today, going strong. They admit about a thousand students now. I imagine the program was probably a little bit smaller when you were there. What what year was that roughly? I came to Summer Bridge in 1989, okay. and we had probably around 240 students yeah. in the program. Yeah, and I'm glad you shared that you still have lifelong friendships. I really want our viewers and listeners to hear that because university is a time to create relationships and what you've said is not unusual. We've had many people that I've spoken with who talk about creating lifelong friendships um, within, you know, here at UC San Diego. So you had mentioned that your first job was with Community Housing Works, and now you're the CEO of MAC, and you've been the CEO for some time. Maybe you can fill in what happened in between? Yes. So I started, I uh, graduated in 93, and I started working at the, um, doing affordable housing. In 1994, uh, MAC had the grand opening of an affordable housing development in Barrio Logan called the Mercado Apartments. I went to the grand opening and I heard the CEO, Roger Cáceres at the time, talk. And he talked about the importance of affordable housing. He talked that about how nothing had been built in Barrio Logan in like the last 25 years. Mm -hmm. And this was the first development in 25 years, uh, really helping the community and he said, but this is more than housing. We, will, we provide workforce programs. We provide education programs. We're building, we built a preschool within the affordable housing. And so we provide the wraparound services so that when somebody comes in, we help give them the tools so that they can leave, mm -hmm. so that they can earn more money, they can leave, they can buy a house. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it was something that, that really changed my view in, in my work that I was at we were building housing and our goal was just let's build more housing. But the view from Mac was it's more than housing. It's a whole holistic approach. And I remember standing there thinking, I want to work at Mac at some point. And like eight years later, through a trajectory, I, um, I moved to Denver, Colorado for about six years. And in 2003, when I was planning to, um, when I was moving back, I called Mac and I bothered them. I was like, I want to work there. And they said, we don't have any positions. So that's one thing I've learned is that there's always a solution. And, and I, I had meetings with them and they shared with different work that they were doing. And I said, I can do this and this. So it just doesn't have to be one specific way of doing the work. And they hired me. They, um, they gave me an opportunity to sell my house in Denver. And when I sold it, I could come and start. And so I've been at Max since 2003. I was a project manager at the time. And education was always important. And I thought that, you know, I've completed my undergraduate and I would go um, just grow by working. 
But I got presented with the opportunity uh, from Mac to, uh, to be supported to go get my master's degree. And I went to USD for the program in leadership and nonprofit management. Mm -hmm. And it really then begin, began to set my trajectory to become the CEO. Um, I was about seven years later, I became the CEO of Chicano Federation. So okay. I grew with Mac. I left to go to the Chicano Federation for a couple of years. And when the CEO at Mac retired, I applied and I came back. So I've been the CEO now for about 11 years. Well, I love the fact that you were persistent. Um, that's what I've heard consistently through your storytelling. You know, you say, I want a job, I want an internship. So it's important for, I think, our young, our young listeners to hear that, that, that it's okay to pick up the phone or it's okay to just put out into the universe what it is that you want. Because if you don't, then you're not gonna get it for sure, right? Yes, um, something that I, uh, repeat a lot over and over is that the answer is always no if you don't ask it. And okay. so I, it, sometimes I joke around and say, okay, go ahead, tell me no, right? Um, I want to ask the question. I encourage people to ask the question um, and, um, and be able to move where you want to, where you want to go. Sometimes I, I, I was lucky because I've loved going to work for the last 30 years. And I know people that will wake up and feel like I need a new job. I don't like it. I don't you know, like working there. So I was lucky that I found something that I love to do the, the very next day after I walked, after I got my diploma that on a Sunday. Right. Monday was my first day working. And so I've been, I feel lucky. But then I have also friends and sisters, my sisters that will say, well, you'll be happy just doing whatever. <laughs> um, so I think part of it is attitude of, of how you look at the world. And um, another thing is that you can actually identify something that you really feel a passion for. And I always encourage people, even if it's an entry level position, like go in there, spend a year, two years, because if you're passionate about the work, it will show in how you deliver it. Mm -hmm. And uh, what will happen is people will see that. And that can create a trajectory for you to be able to grow into those, um, into higher level positions within that, uh, that job. Well, you mentioned Gabriela, who also is an alum of UC San Diego and your sisters. I'm curious about what role, if any, your sisters played in your academic persistence. I mean, we know that Gabriela said, no, you have to apply, but um, because they were ahead of you, did you find yourself able to kind of lean into them and get advice from them? Yes, and, and it was more them leaning into me. Okay. Uh, the, uh, so when, when I applied, my major that I selected was engineering, electrical engineering, and it was a numbers, finance, I mean, a numbers and a science based program. And I thought this is really cool. And, um, but Gabriela, my sister, was and had an electrical engineer major as well. So I was, I'll do what my sister was doing. Mm -hmm. And so for two years, I was on the path for to become an electrical engineer. And during those first two years, um, my sisters would actually sometimes show up on campus. Mm. And uh, one, I, one applied for a credit card for me so that in case I ever needed anything, I would, I can use it. In case, in case I found myself not being able to pay for something. Right. Uh, so I remember those little moments of my sisters making sure that I was, um, I had what I needed right. uh, during school. Gabriela would come by. Uh, she took a little bit longer uh, to graduate. She had gotten into a, an accident where she got run over by a drunk driver. And so she lost some some time of a schooling. So. She, we were both on campus at the same time, and so she would stop by, and we would go have lunch, and um, uh, and she would buy me lunch. So that was always good when when they were paid for <laughs> for things. But yeah, no, um, they played a big role in in uh, checking in on me, checking in on me. Um, I want to also just explore a little bit about graduation, and maybe you can share what was that day like, what did it feel like. Um, just tell us a little story about what your graduation was like. Wow. So my, my graduation was uh, memorable. Um, it was, um, and it was a Sunday. All my sisters and my mom and dad and uncles, aunts and uncles uh, were here. 
Um, I remember having my uh, my robe on, having my uh, my hat. I, I forgot what you call the hat. Uh, and uh, and my dad had, you know, it was just, this is as I was getting ready in the morning. And my dad was like, are you wearing, are you gonna wear those shoes? I was wearing some tennis shoes. Like, well, I, this is all the shoes I have, dad. And um, he said, no, you need to, you need to have very nice uh, dress shoes. And uh, we went to UTC mm -hmm. here and um, there's a store called Florsheim and I bought like a nice, you know, lace, black lace, uh, lace up shoes, dress shoes. Uh, and and so I remember walking. I remember, if the, and I'm mentioning the shoes because uh, it was an experience that I had with my dad and uh, mm -hmm. my sisters there. But um, and I remember thinking, my dad and my mom just had the the last child out of five. All five of us had a bachelor's degree. We had all graduated from college. Right. right. And and at that moment, I already knew that. It was a feat, like it was a huge, um, not many of us had gotten these opportunities. Through what I had learned about from Summer Bridge and the students that were coming here, because I also did have friends that dropped out. Right. And um, so I remember we have a picture where my dad is looking at the diploma and he's got a big smile on his face and his face is kind of red. Mm. So I know that he had been crying, mm. you know, that he had shed some tears, although he didn't cry in front of us very often. Um, and so it, is, it, it was a memorable moment. And those shoes, I still have those shoes and I still wear them. Mm. I don't wear them for just any occasion. Um, uh, it's whenever I do have a special occasion, I probably wear them two or three times a year. So that's why they've lasted for right. so long. But I purposely, uh, those were my graduation shoes and those were the shoes that I can have this memory with, right. with my family. They have special significance yes. and meaning. Yes, I don't know why I picked the shoes, but that's, that's what it was. Yeah, yeah. That's a beautiful story. Thank you for sharing that story. As we begin to wrap up our time together, I wonder if there's any advice you would offer our young scholars who are listening or watching, to, watching this video. Yes, absolutely. Um, so my experience uh, of when I came to orientation and I didn't see people like me and, and thought, wow, like I don't know that I want to come here because I want to be around people that I'm around, that I already, like that I'm comfortable with. My advice is um, wherever you go where you feel like you don't belong, it's you do. Mm. And it's... Um, you belong in every room, mm -hmm. in every room, in every space, in every opportunity. And sometimes it's not easy. Mm -hmm. And and so sometimes we have to be the first ones to be able to open up those doors because once those doors open, you can bring others with you. It's always okay to have that, that uh, pit in your stomach, to be nervous, to be afraid of things. Um, so the, the, the hardest thing is to take that step of risk. Right. And for me, I, I had the resources. I had my sisters. I had, um, uh, so I took advantage of that without really, you know, intentional, because some of these things were not intentional. They, they happened around me. But if anybody's listening, um, intention can also come from us. Yes. Like our initiative. And if, if we feel like we want to go do something, just start asking the questions and you'll get connected to somebody that can help you uh, get there. There's, when you're looking for an internship, when you're looking for a job and you're a, and you're a student here at UCSD, most of the people where you go and approach, they're gonna wanna help you. They're gonna say, look, this student, uh, they came up, they talked to me, they wanna, they wanna do X, Y, and Z. And um, I would say more than 50% of the time, they'll say, I want to help them. Yes. I'm going to figure out a way to connect them to where they need to. Um, most people want to help. That's true. Most people do want to help. And, and you uh, have an internship placement for UCSD students. Is that right? Yes. So when I came into my field back in 1993, for several years, um, we would have like grand openings of uh, a new building and the news, the media would come and they want to do a story on it. 
and whenever the Univision, Telemundo, whenever the uh, Spanish-speaking media would come, they would say, let's get Arnulfo because he can do the interviews in Spanish. Well, I was the only one. Mm. I was the only Latino. I was the only one who actually spoke Spanish. I was the only one that, that could do that. And I started paying attention to other organizations and developers, and there were not many Latinos in our field of doing development. There were in the service side of it, like resident, like helping with the social service, but not in the development side of it. And so my experience and my opportunity, I got it through UCSD. And I remember that once I started working at Mac um, and I had the opportunity to start defining how I run, I became a director. I reached out to the Urban Studies and Planning Program and uh, every May we would go out and advertise for a paid internship. And I wanted to make sure it was paid. Mm. Uh, the, Cause sometimes our students, they have to work and they can't do the unpaid internships. Right, and so right. I think we've had about 14 interns since 2004. Uh, and you know, sometimes we would have one intern, sometimes two, and they would start full-time during the summer and then part-time during the year. And it falls within their urban studies and planning sequence. So. Um, we continue to do that. We have an intern right now. And the previous intern that we had, we hired her. She's working with us nice. uh, as a project manager. So nice. um, it does create opportunities for people to get the experience and get them exposed to this type of work. It's wonderful. I don't know if I want to thank you for being here with us today. Um, I'm very glad that you could come because what we hear from our students when we ask them why they want to attend UC San Diego, they always say, to help my family, help my community, and help myself. And I think your trajectory is a beautiful example of that realization of those three types of help. So thank you so much for being with us. It was a pleasure chatting with you. Thank you for having me.